uh, this Tuesday in Beirut. Uh, double suicide blasts targeting the Iranian embassy. There have been bombings before, as our panel's been saying, but suicide bombings and actually targeting Iran's embassy, that's, uh, that's unprecedented, you might say. Uh, with us from Beirut, Lebanese historian, uh, publisher and social activist uh, Lachman Slim from London. Jonathan Paris of the Atlantic Council uh, is with us. And here in the studio, Eli Abdelhay of the uh, Lebanese March 14th coalition uh, movement and France 24 reporter Maisa Awad. Uh, just before the break, uh, Lachman Slim, uh, you and Maisa were both mentioning how, uh, to add, we, we mention, we call Hezbollah a Shia movement. You yourself are Shiite and you don't support Hezbollah. And uh, it, it should be noted there are also Sunnis who do support Hezbollah. Of course, you know, uh, Hezbollah's uh, work within the Sunnah community to create within it its fifth column is a sustainable work. But we cannot say that Hezbollah enjoy a real uh, popularity within the Sunnah community. The Sunnah community in Lebanon is still suffering from the wounded inflicted to it since 2005, since the assassination of uh, late Prime Minister Rafi al-Hariri. So, yes, there is some voices within the Sunnah community which could uh, support Hezbollah, but I don't think that uh, these voices represent a real uh, constituency. While as within the Shia community, we see clearly that finally uh, the Lebanese Shia are starting since years to uh, acknowledge their dissidents vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Hezbollah. Would it be through municipal elections? Would it be through uh, the demonstrations. Uh, the, and so finally, the difference between uh, the Shia dissidents and the Sunnah allegiance to Hezbollah is clear and uh, no one call it into question. In addition, let me tell you that what happened today in Beirut happened inside the heart of the Hezbollah stronghold. And it's a big security failure for Hezbollah, which claimed to, fight, to be fighting in Syria in order to protect those Lebanese and more specifically those Lebanese Shia. So I believe that Hezbollah today, as Jonathan was saying, also has exhausted all the rationals of his involvement in Syria and will have to find more convincing rationals to address its own and, and, constituency. And, and Jonathan Paris was saying that um, it's uh, it's really a lot about Syria. In fact, all about Syria. Do you agree that uh, or that this attack today is about Syria? I fully agree also that any domestic reading of the blast of today is irrelevant. The blast of today is like attacking Tehran, but in Beirut. It's an attack against Tehran, against the Iranian project, against the Iranian support to the Assad regime, against the abuse of the Iranian, of the Lebanese uh, territory. So obviously, uh, today, the incident or the blast happened in Beirut and more specifically in the southern suburb of Beirut. But the target is the Iranians uh, and the Iranian expansionist project. Now, uh, uh, Lebanon, of course, on the front line of what's going on uh, in, just across the border in Syria. According to the United Nations, number of registered Syrian refugees in Lebanon will top 300,000 uh, next month. Uh, Maisa, though, those numbers... Those are registered refugees. Yes. The, the actual numbers, probably yeah. a lot higher. And this is for a country of four and a half million. Definitely. That's why whenever we go to Lebanon, I've been there since a few months ago, everybody is talking about the Syrian crisis, starting from the taxi driver to the top-notch intellectual. The, what's happening in Syria is really present in the Lebanese menu, on the Lebanese menu, if um, I may say, on because what happens in Syria touches the lives of many in Lebanon. Let's not forget that Lebanon is a country that is suffering from a very weak infrastructure that is not that was not prepared to receive this big number of re refugees, and also 
the tensions that uh, happened during the last few months have split the Lebanese society. And what we are witnessing today, what we are witnessing um, this, um, all these debates and sometimes battles that are taking place, whether uh, when it comes to the daily discussions or I, I was even gonna, I was more. Gonna, I was gonna say on that point, yeah. you're from Southern Lebanon. Yeah. And has, have you witnessed that in your home village, for instance? Well, it's not only in my home village. I've witnessed that in Beirut. I've witnessed that in Beka. Wherever you go, but neighbors you who aren't speaking to each other anymore. Even or? friends sometimes not talking to each other is because of what's happening in Syria. And let's not forget that. People who are supporters of Hezbollah think that the presence of Hezbollah in Syria is a matter of life or death against uh, Israel. This is how they link it. They see it from a very geostrategic point of view. And other opponents to Hezbollah think that what Hezbollah is doing is taking Lebanon down the cliff and we are going towards another civil war, uh, just like the one that took place from the 1975 to the 1990. So the divisions are growing bigger and bigger. And let's not forget that so many voices right now are concerned with the refugees in Lebanon because some of uh, those refugees are uh, being um, uh, um, uh, treated in a very discriminatory uh, uh, discriminatory way, way. Yeah, yeah, discriminatory way, and uh, some of them are suffering to get their food and to get job and to get uh, their life a, a decent way of life. So it's a strain. It's a strain all around. Definitely, to everybody in Lebanon, whether for people who support Hezbollah and those who uh, do not endorse uh, Hezbollah at all. Now um, uh, the. Uh, um uh, we have one tweet that we'd like to mention to you before before we continue from Joseph. He says, the bomb blast outside the Iranian embassy in Beirut shows the Syrian conflict can engulf the whole Middle East at uh, any time. Now, a few days back, when Hezbollah's leader spoke on the commemoration of Ashura, one of Shia Islam's holiest days, Hassan Nasrallah said his movement had, quote, neutralized the United States' designs to topple Assad in Syria Nasrallah, who says his forces are in Syria for the duration. As long as the reasons are there, we will be there. The problem in Lebanon, as ever, is that they turn outcomes into reasons and they ignore the reasons. They speak about our retreat and, let me be clear about this, whoever speaks about the retreat of Hezbollah from Syria as a precondition for the formation of a Lebanese government is putting forward a precondition that is destructive. But for the time being, there is no uh, government uh, that's been formed, as Maisa was mentioning uh, in part one of our discussion. Should the formation of that government wait until Hezbollah leaves Syria or should a deal be struck before then? Look, we have two issues here. First, the uh, intervention of Hezbollah in Syria is pulling all the problems to Lebanon. And we think, as uh, Mr. Lockman said and Mr. Jonathan, that Iranians are, are blocked into the Syrian crisis. Hezbollah, who is the arm of uh, Iranian in Syria... So two, two issues is, is, what, is what Nasrallah was saying, that they're two separate issues. The yes. election on the one two, hand yes. and Syria on the other. Yeah, but the problem is... If we form, we, what we are saying ourselves is to form a government which is independent from all other parties for, for a simple reason. We do not want to cover what Hezbollah is doing in, in Syria by the Lebanese government, official government. And that's why we are saying that we want to, do, to, uh, to form an independent government not uh, involving neither Hezbollah, neither uh, Farsh, uh, March 14. And in this way, we do not cover officially what Hezbollah is doing in Syria. Because what Hezbollah is doing in Syria, he said in the past that let's go and fight there to avoid a war for, 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 for Lebanon. And But what he is doing there is pulling all terrorists into, into Lebanon. And we, not, we do not know who is doing what in Lebanon because, because of this intervention. So what he is doing... Okay, so your, is, your, your stance is, is that... 
let's have a government made up of technocrats, not of uh, political parties. Technic technocrats and the people who can, uh, let's say, manage the day-to-day -day people of, of Lebanese people. And let's uh, leave the political uh, issues for the political parties with this uh, round table we have uh, in Lebanon for the time being. Uh, Lachman Slim, uh, is that feasible, what uh, Ali Abdelhaiz is suggesting? Uh, I think that it's just delusional. It's not possible to split political issues from day-to-day -day issues. Uh, we know very well that uh, forming a government in Lebanon is always the result of a political agreement. And today we are very far from any kind of domestic or regional political agreement. So, uh, personally, I would not say that Lebanon is living a ministerial crisis. Lebanon is living once more an existential crisis, which is uh, putting at stake uh, its, its mere existence. Uh, Hezbollah's intervention in Syria is bringing part of Syria into Lebanon. Uh, it's uh, making, uh, it's causing a kind of Sunnitization of the uh, of the Lebanese uh, moderate Sunnis, and I really don't see how a government, any government, could help fixing these issues. So probably it's better for Lebanon to remain in this in limbo situation. Uh, perhaps it will continue to attract some more attention from the international community than if it has a kind of a standard government unable to uh, process any of the problems that the country is facing. Well, but, but meanwhile, Mr. Slim, meanwhile, Lebanese are suffering. This limbo doesn't come uh, in a, a very happy uh, phase for Lebanese people. Let's not forget that but for now, the, whether I on totally the judiciary agree with level, you that so Lebanese we cannot, are... let's not forget that even historically forming a Lebanese government usually happens in Beirut, but starts somewhere in Riyadh and in even Damascus a few years ago, goes to Tehran and then go back sometimes to, to, to the States. So talking about this limbo as a positive thing for the time being, I think it's very dangerous given the I am not saying it's yeah. a positive thing. I am saying it's the less worth because we saw under the government of Mr. Najib Mi'ati how Lebanon's foreign policy was hijacked by Hezbollah. We saw finally that Hezbollah and its Iranian and Syrian patrons were using the existence of a government to finally advance their own agenda. So many While vetoes as today for, with for, from so many political uh, parties in Lebanon, Mr. Slim. For months now, Mr. Tamam Salam is trying to form this government and it doesn't look that it's going to see the light uh, soon. Every time we have names in, on the table, we have vetoes, whether from Hezbollah or other political parties. So definitely the situation is getting really complicated in Lebanon and people are paying the price. And today it was very easy to notice whether on, on the, you know, uh, Facebook or Twitter, people in Lebanon, they have had enough of what's and, going on. And we have a comment here on the Twitter I'm from not Firas. Sure that people... I mean, I know that I am defending a bit a cynical point of view, but I think that uh, this cynical point of view is one of the uh, tools. I mean, not forming a government is perhaps a tool to keep Lebanon uh, on the radar. To keep, to keep Lebanon and on the radar. And at this moment, and, and, and perhaps... Uh, on the radar of the international community, while as normalizing the situation and accepting... Uh, even a presence of Hezbollah within the government will lead us to go back to a kind of uh, to, to become again the hostage of Hezbollah's policies and the ones of its patrons. All right. So everybody with uh, their benefactors, some go to Riyadh, others go to Tehran. Uh, Jonathan Paris, your thoughts on this. Uh, is it better for now for the Lebanese to have a status quo and wait for better days? I, I guess I agree with Mr. Slim, but I think we're missing the broader point, which is why is Iran, why is Iran being targeted here? And I think it's because it was only a matter of time 
that Iran's involvement in Syria, Iran literally is buttressing Assad now, that Iran would eventually become a target of what I heard earlier from Slim, the Sunnization of the Lebanese Sunni. They, they don't want to see Assad win, and they're going to do everything they can to hit the supporters of, of Assad. And it's clear that Iran and Hezbollah are the main supporters of, of Assad. So I think it's pretty clear we have a sectarian conflict in Syria that has spilled over into Lebanon. Whatever the government does or doesn't do in Lebanon, it's, it's primarily the cause is primarily in Damascus, not in Beirut. All right, the cause primarily in Damascus and uh, not Beirut. Um, and uh, of course, this blast happening on the eve of uh, those talks that are due to open Wednesday in Geneva, Jonathan, Paris. Uh, a lot of people have high hopes uh, for this uh, second round of negotiations, which are not about Syria, but about Iran's nuclear program, saying this could really prime the pump for fundamental change in the region. Your thoughts? Uh, my thought is that Iran needs this deal a lot more than the P5 plus one. Iran is really in trouble. They're in trouble in Syria. They're in trouble in the Arab world, uh, the Sunni world, and they're in trouble at home in the, their economy. Just today, their ga Iran gas company has collapsed. So they really need to get uh, sanctions relief, and they're going to have to give up their Iranian nuclear program, at least the weapons part of it, in order to get relief. I don't think the P5 plus one is going to go easy on them tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, amid all of this, uh, in his uh, speeches, has been openly rooting for a deal in Geneva, saying the alternative will be war. All right, uh, Nasrallah saying... Uh, the, nego course. the negotiations uh, uh, could end one of two ways, either reach an agreement or things might head into war, Jonathan Paris. Are you surprised to hear Hassan Nasrallah uh, defending uh, the bargaining that's going yeah. on? No, uh, Nasrallah is giving you the Iran point of view. Iran wants this deal because they are desperate. They need sanctions relief. Their economy is collapsing. They're in a Vietnam in in. in and Damascus. They need this more than the West. So, of course, Nasrallah is rooting for a conclusion of this deal because it will get Iran off the hot seat. It will relieve them of sanctions or substantial sanctions and allow their economy to at least partly recover. Meanwhile, they continue to enrich uranium. So it's, it's very interesting that Nasrallah would support Iran because it's in Iran's interest to get this deal. Uh, Lachman Slim, your thoughts. Will a deal in Geneva be good news or bad news for Lebanon? Uh, let's say that uh, the American administration is continuing to say that it's only discussing about uh, nuclear with Iran. But obviously, in this region, we fear that uh, the discussion is not limited only to nuclear and that the role of Iran is on the table also. In this sense, I would say that a deal with Iran is clearly not a good news for us. And I think that when I say us, it doesn't mean only uh, the Saudi Arabia or some other Gulf state states, but uh, it means also all those who first suffered from the Iranian influence over all these years and who don't want to see a kind of uh, uh, Iranian peace but isn't being this a way to, isn't this a way to break the American Isn't blessing. this a way to break the ice and to ease that tension and to get away from the polarization that you were so eloquently describing a moment ago? But I think that in this very moment where finally we are put between two uh, very hard and two very bitter choices, uh, if the choice is uh, between two uh, worst uh, case scenarios, uh, we, we, we should feel free to do it. 
But I would like to comment uh, on your question regarding uh, Sec Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, and what he said. You know, I think that it's a big, um, it's a big misunderstanding to think that uh, uh, Nasrallah could decide about uh, what he think uh, regarding uh, uh, the Iranian-American negotiations. Finally, Secretary General of Hezbollah is a part of the Iranian uh, is is member of the Iranian constellation. He does not have any room to think by his own. So let's be clear about this and let's be clear about Hezbollah's intervention in Syria. It's finally the decision is taken in Tehran and implemented in Beirut. Well, definitely an agreement with Iran will make some people very happy in Lebanon and will make others really upset and really sad. Just let's not forget one fact, what's happening now on the ground in Syria, what's happening in Qara. The, the, the regime forces are actually taking over um, very important and strategic highways that actually um, provide a certain security uh, to uh, Damascus. And uh, actually, they are securing the, the um, gateways between Damascus and the Syrian coast. That's from one side. From the other, some of uh, um, Lebanese, uh, you know, um, um, uh, let's say people or, or forces or political, you know, um, parties think that any agreement done with Iran right now mean, uh, means automatically that they will be put aside and that Washington basically will be no longer interested in supporting in a way or in another uh, the, the Syrian opposition, and they think that this is very dangerous and that it will enable the Syrian regime to take a complete control and no one will be able to help them. So definitely we can see the sense of fear uh, in Lebanon for definitely some people, for some political parties uh, of any possible, uh, possible deal between Iran and uh, uh, other uh, f foreign countries. And you don't think that this, Ali Abdelhay, that this will reduce, again, that polarization that exists that, it, that it, you've been describing? It may, it may guide the, the solution of the problem, but maybe not in the way or, uh, that will interest the local people, local uh, regional people. What I think when we have uh, international forces negotiating between each other, uh, USA, Russia, and Iran, maybe Syria, the regime is uh, taking uh, advantage of these negotiations to, to stay here. Maybe Israel is taking advantage of this. So we don't know what is negotiated really. But that's why we say that we want to neutralize ourselves in, the, in this region. We want to avoid getting Lebanese, uh, Lebanese people into this, into this uh, oven, uh, in the crisis, the regional crisis. And that's why we are asking Hezbollah to withdraw his forces from, from Syria to avoid getting involved in this, in this crisis. And we are asking our, friend, our friends in uh, uh, European countries and Occidental countries who are involved in the resolution 1701 to help the Lebanese army to, uh, to protect the frontier between Lebanon and Syria to protect uh, Lebanon from social crisis, from terrorists, from all what's happening into, uh, into Syria to pull it into, into, into Lebanon. Because we have, you know, in 82, there, are, there were some, nego some negotiations between uh, USA, Syria, and, uh, and maybe Israel was involved. And uh, we, uh, Lebanese forces, uh, we have our uh, leader, Bashir Jamal, who was killed, assassinated. And if you go into all the studies, what happened be behind it, you say sometimes it's a win-win situation for others, not for us. And that's why when you have all these uh, negotiations, if it's not clear, they are not negotiating our interest. They are negotiating their interest. So let's see how it's, what's happening there. But for us, what we can control is to control our Lebanon. And that's why we have to protect all, 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 all together. We want to protect our Lebanon 
with our forces in order to avoid what's Although happening Although it doesn't there. seem realistic, let's just look what's happening in Ersel. That's a town on the eastern yeah. side of, of Lebanon where you have thousands of refugees, usually uh, fighters from the opposition, they seek refuge in this city. It's just one example of um, um, the, the conflict that's going on. And how it's, been, how it's spilling over. It, Definitely conflicts sometimes oh. with, yeah, with the Lebanese army and... And, uh, and now they are talking about, you know, the, the Kalamun region, the war in, in, in Syria. In the strategic uh, discussions uh, happening, in the army discussions are happening now, we, have, we can read that the, the Syrian army is trying to... Uh, to attack uh, Arsal. Okay, so you're, you're, you're wary, you're wary of, uh, again, of that, of that spillover effect increasing. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because we're, yes. we're out of time. Ali Abdelhay, I want, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Maisa Awad. I want to thank uh, Jonathan Paris for joining us from London and Lachman Slim in Beirut. Thank you for being with us here in the France Penquette debate.